Good. The conversation we're going to be have is best practices in the extractive industry. Um, I'm very happy that Minister Parody is with us to make some introductory remarks. I was very enthusiastic about having this conversation about the extractive industry, and we've got really an excellent panel to talk about. We have Anita George, who's a Senior Director for Global Practice on Energy and Extractives for the World Bank Group. We have Daniel Dumas, who's the exec Executive Director of the Canadian Institute for Extractive Industries and Development, uh, perfect for this. Marty Flax, who's the Deputy Director of the Office of Energy Programs um, at the Department of State, and then Joanna Nessa Tuttle, who's the Manager for uh, development and public policy, government and public affairs at uh, Chevron Corporation and is a CSIS alum, so thank you for being here. So I think we've got the right panel for this, but the reason I thought this was important is that when I said earlier is that 51 of 54 sub-Saharan African countries are either uh, developing uh, oil and gas uh, resources or they're going to be, and when 60 percent of uh, oil and gas comes from the developing world that it is managing these resources and attracting investment. Are these going to be more or less salient over the next five to ten years? They're going to be more salient over the next five to ten years. So my view is that Canada has a lot to teach us about how to attract investment, how to respect property rights, how to respect contracts, and then how to manage those resources in a responsible way. And so I, people come to Canada, they come to Australia, they come to Nordic countries to learn how to do that in an effective way. So really appreciate having Minister Paradis, who comes from a mining background, so knows something about, about this conversation, is also the former Commerce Minister. So I think it's, it's a, again, it's another one of these nexus issues between the private sector and development, and, and there's a governance overlay to all this. So, Minister, please come on up and just share a few thoughts with us. Thanks very much for being here again. Come on, please welcome the Minister. Thank you very much, Dan. This is a, a great, great honor to be here today for the second time. Um, as you alluded to, uh, I, I think uh, it's important. Yes, I am uh, coming from a mining town, and I could uh, appreciate uh, front, uh, firsthand how it makes a big and positive difference for a development community. I think I should s start this way. Let's put it simply as it is. I'll just say Canada works to advance international standards and guidelines to improve performance by all actors involved in the extractive sector. This is what we want to do. And uh, I mean, um, as you just alluded, uh, then uh, we can agree that no country is a better example of uh, harnessing resource wealth for development than Canada, especially in the mining sector. Uh, we're very proud that our uh, natural resource uh, endowments have, uh, have helped us build sustainable, diversified, and growing national economy. And our resource sector experience and expertise have long sustained on economic growth. But it has to be done correctly with uh, basic principles as good governance, rule, rule of law, transparency, predictability. So this is why we're proud to say today that uh, uh, Canada is uh, well known as a world leader in responsible resource development. And further, the Canadian approach to the sector strengthens community engagement so all stakeholders can benefit from natural resource development. I think this is a key uh, fundamental principle here. Uh, so the, this is why also uh, so many partners in the developing world turn to us for advice on how best to manage their natural resources. And there is no doubt that a responsibly managed resource sector can deliver economic, economic opportunities, jobs, and trainings as well as indirect benefits such as better health care, education, and public services for the most vulnerable women and children, which is also a priority for Canada. In fact, increasing transparency and accountability in natural resource development is the only way to know for sure that the long-term benefits are being enjoyed by all citizens. Uh, I should. I should just, just go a little bit over the programming that we have to demonstrate, concretely speaking, that. Uh, we want to uh, be a leader in the, this kind of uh, 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 responsible natural resources development. So of course, uh, we are committed to working with developing countries to build resource governance capacity, promote local economic development, and enable communities to get the maximum benefit from the extractive sector. 
And this is why I was very proud to, uh, to, to announce the launch of the, uh, inter uh, the, the Canadian International Institute for Extractive Industries and Development. And uh, I see Daniel Dumas here, very happy. I think this is a tremendous way uh, that we can uh, endeavor to share best practices more widely. Also, we, uh, we, uh, we support the implementation of the Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative in many countries. I think it, uh, it's very fruitful. We, we saw a lot of progress so far, and I think this is uh, something to watch and follow. Um, we, uh, we, uh, we also invested $1.1 million to the International Institute for Sustainable Development. So that helps developing countries strengthen their mineral development regimes and promotes an integrated approach that increases water, energy, and food security. Uh, in Ethiopia, for example, we are contributing $15 million towards strengthening education for mining. And this will ensure that both men and women benefit from employment opportunities in the extractive sector in fields such as geology and mining engineering. Uh, I have to mention also that we, uh, we, uh, we are uh, the largest donor to the African Minerals Development Center. Uh, we expect the center to be the source of technical expertise to help African countries manage their mining sectors and harmonize policies across member states. We are also working with the Association of, Canadi of Canadian Community Colleges on a six-year project in Mozambique that will help Mozambicans develop the skills required to meet the demands of an extractive sector in full growth. Two-year project that has helped the government of Mozambique create a policy on corporate social responsibility. And we have also created the Extractives Cooperation for Enhanced Economic Development, which is called Exceed. And individual projects to be funded under Exceed will leverage Canadian expertise in strategic partnerships. And we'll use these partnerships to help build the capacity of African countries to maximize the benefits of their own resources wealth. Uh, the energy uh, sector capacity building project that will help the government of Tanzania also is a good project. This will develop its growing natural gas sector and form uh, public-private partnership for power generation. The project includes, to the, to the Tanzanian, uh, includes support to the Tanzanian Vocational Education Training Authority to support the training of petroleum professionals. So that gives you uh, a little bit of snapshot about what uh, we are doing here. We are very, very keen to continue go, to go down this way. I've been loud and clear. Uh, there is a strong uh, political will to uh, explore all of the opportunities uh, that we have, seize the opportunities, and make sure that also we do support uh, adequately uh, the initiatives, but the organizations I just talked about, the Canadian International Institute, and exceed and uh, other projects like that. Uh, I must uh, mention also on this point that we have uh, started new development programs in Burma and Mongolia, both countries with considerable potential uh, in extractive industries. Uh, for example, Canada aims to strengthen Mongolia's management of its extractive sector by improving the quality and transparency of Mongolia's policies and laws as they relate to the mining sector as well as the professionalism of their civil service. So um, we know that a vibrant civil society enables people to hold their governments to account, lead a life of dignity, and participate in decision-making that affect them. And there is no doubt in my mind that this contributes toward reducing poverty and ensuring sustainable development. And this is why Canada is using its development dollars to invest in people, so that communities can gain the maximum benefit from emerging economic opportunities. So there are projects like that. We have uh, uh, a good list of kind of projects like that in which we, we support civil society. It's good to work on strengthening uh, state capacity governance, but we have to involve the people. This is a people matter here. So um, this is on that note that I will leave you just to tell you that uh, the, our government, uh, my department, is focusing on growing economies more sustainably, sustainably, managing resources more responsibly, and working to reduce poverty with the means I just alluded to. So Dan, thank you again for having this opportunity. It's uh, an honor for me to share these uh, comments on this tribune. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, much Minister. Thank you. Thanks a lot. I really appreciate it. Thanks for doing this. Okay. 
Great. This is a. Uh, this is, we really have a great panel. Uh, I want to especially thank Anita George, who um, has a very busy week, I suspect. It's the World Bank annual meeting, so thanks for making time in your schedule to be with us. And also, Daniel Dumas, who um, gets the uh, award for flying in the, the farthest, I suspect, to be with us, along with Ian Brody, who also came from far away to be with us. So we have a really great panel. You have your, their bios in the folders, so I won't get into any too, too much detail about them, the, but, but this is a very qualified panel to discuss this important challenge at the nexus of development and extractive resource management, as well as attracting investment. How do you manage these issues? It's a question of governance, a question of civil society, it's a question of private investment, and it's a critical development question. So. I'm going to start first uh, with Anita. You're currently at the World Bank. You're running a functional program where you focus on a variety of extractive policy issues. Uh, in many ways, you're at the center of developing country policy and private sector activities, and you're often part of the conversation with developing country governments around the promise of extractive. So how is the World Bank thinking of, think about this issue and how, talk a little bit about how your work impacts on this, on this conversation of managing extractive wealth? Thank you very much, Daniel, and uh, thank you all for having me here, for inviting me. I have to say I have a huge soft spot for Canada and Canadians because uh, I did my formative schooling years at the Lester Pearson College on Vancouver Island. So something that has shaped me. So um, it's really an honor for me to be here. In response to your question, uh, for the World Bank Group, we uh, have really several corporate goals, but I would stress on three. One being eradicating extreme poverty. The second is creating shared prosperity. And the overlay on both these is really sustainability. And uh, we see that the World Bank Group uh, can play a big role in terms of promoting all these three. So why is it that we think that the extractives portfolio is important for the World Bank Group as a development institution? Around uh, 3.5 billion people live in oil and uh, resource-rich countries. 70% of these are really uh, living in extreme poverty and um, while the resources uh, account for more than 10 trillion a year, and uh, that's, that's a big part of the global GDP. However, um, we find that in many of the countries which are resource rich, the benefits of those resources haven't really uh, reached the community uh, and haven't really had an impact in terms of taking the entire development of those countries to another level. Just to give you an example, Africa's oil and mineral exports are worth $305 billion, which is almost seven times the um, development assistance that goes to Africa. So it is really telling for us that if we can develop the extractive industries sustainably, it can really be the factor that changes more than World Bank assistance or any of this uh, aid flows. This is really the industry that can make a difference to the African continent. But we know the stark reality on the ground is that a lot of the countries that are resource rich, and uh, um, the Honorable Minister referred to it, uh, suffer from poverty, from corruption, in many cases conflict, violence, and uh, a lot of this is stemming from weak governance. So one of the big uh, areas that we as the World Bank look to is uh, really having an impact on strengthening institutions, governance. And this cannot be done in isolation from the private sector. And we see the private sector playing a big role. Uh, the EITI initiative, which all of you are very familiar with, is one that where the World Bank Group has spent a lot of effort and energy to make sure that it's not just that you have uh, countries signing up,
but that we work side by side with the countries uh, to develop their capabilities and capacities. And the new, um, or rather I should say the improved EITI also looks into the institutional aspects of countries that have signed up. So creating national councils, for example, that have the wherewithal and have the right people who can actually make sure that what countries commit to in EITI actually gets implemented on the ground. Uh, a second area where uh, to translate this resource wealth to development, and I'm very happy to see two of my colleagues from before, Peter Voike, who used to head IFC, and Harold Rosen, who was the guru of small and medium enterprise development in the IFC. And one of the things that we as the World Bank Group try to do is really to focus on developing an ecosystem around the large mining operations and oil and gas. Uh, so also giving importance to creating uh, small enterprises around the large enterprise, uh, creating shared infrastructure. This is a new initiative. We have a very interesting uh, study that has been done which superimposes uh, spatially the mines in Africa with the power grids in Africa. And it's very interesting to see that actually most of the mines are operating with captive uh, power because they are in remote areas and they are using diesel or heavy fuel oil. And the initiative that we are trying to propose through the power of the mine is to get mining companies to substitute these polluting fuels with cleaner sources of energy and in doing so, also to connect the communities that surround these mines. And this would be a win-win for them because in our analysis, these sources of power are cheaper, cleaner, and it can also service the community. Um, of course, uh, again, I give a lot of credit to Peter Voike because he was one of the people who uh, made sure that we mainstreamed the concept and the concern on sustainability into every single transaction that we do as the World Bank Group. And we have our safeguards uh, or environmental and social standards, which is something which when we started off several years ago, it was seen as a burden by a lot of the private sector companies. But I'm proud to say that today, a lot of companies reach out to us to provide support support, advice, and uh, hand-holding, if I may say, even very large, sophisticated companies who would like to make sure that they follow the environmental and social standards uh, and safeguards. Uh, one other initiative that I would like to mention, again, which is bringing resources and development together, is our focus on community development. So we have also taken a lot of pains to create a group that can work with large mining companies and our own investment officers. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, Daniel, you may have been part of, with, yes, where we developed, uh, uh, we develop industries and benefits for the community around the mines. The last point I'd like to make is something where I'm really hoping that Canada would step up and be a leader. Yeah. And this is the uh, Global Gas Flaring Reduction Initiative. So we, as the World Bank Group, have said that we would like to have countries and companies sign up to zero routine gas flaring by 2030. And I'm very happy to say that through the activities of the Global Gas Flaring Reduction Team, they, there is a lot of momentum to sign up to this um, uh, initiative. And Canada is one of the countries and Canadian private sector who we are hoping will join this initiative and really give the momentum, as the Honorable Minister mentioned, as an example of a country that has done things right in the resources uh, sector. And we hope that you would do this in a very um, 
uh, I would say, visible way for many of our other countries to learn from. And signing up for the zero routine flaring initiative would be one way to do that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Daniel, uh, thank you for being here. You had a past life at the IMF and uh, working on issues related to petroleum and mining policy uh, and governance. And you're now at the Canadian Institute for Extractive Industries and Development, where you study this issue from a Canadian perspective, or you share this Canadian perspective with others. It, it, Canada is seen as a role model in this, absolutely, uh, along with Norway. Uh, so what are the challenges and opportunities for developing country partners in managing their extractive industries? And how, and the minister talked a little bit about this, but talk a little bit more about how Canada engages with companies, provincial governments, and others, including the Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative. Thank you, Daniel, and thank you for, to CSIS for the invit invitation this morning. Um, the, uh, and I would also like to thank DFAD-D, especially Minister Paradis and Deputy Minister Brown for their the financial support to the Institute, and I could even say the moral support to the Institute. Um, it, it's a bit of a challenge to discuss best practices in like seven minutes or something, so I'll... I'll, I'll give I'll, you eight. Yeah, no, I'll just give me eight, thank you. Um, you know, we start from the belief that there's one, if there's one sector that can lift a country out of poverty, it's really the extractive sector. Um, and, and so that's, I guess, the starting point where we've been developing a work program. And this work program has mainly like three pillars. In, and it, one is uh, to make sure that countries have adequate frameworks, um, strong institution, and good governance principles. And, and these three pillars are really like a, like a tripod. So if one of the legs is missing, the whole thing is like an unstable equilibrium. So, so for us, it's important to work on, on the, at the three level. Um, in the past 10, 15, 20 years, like an organization like the World Bank, I've done quite a bit of work in terms of improving frameworks. And you know, if you look at countries, they are very often, uh, let's take Africa, uh, quite modern uh, mining policy or mining regulation, mining law, fiscal regime. But there's, there's a, sometimes a, a problem for countries to administer and enforce these frameworks. Um, and if there's a gap, there's some countries, the gap is still at the framework level, but in some other cases, it's really in the implementation and how countries can administer these frameworks. Um, one of the, uh, one of the issues, for instance, in terms of, 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 of the administration is that if you go to in many countries, uh, for a given countries, let's say with 20 mining contracts or mining agreement, there will probably be more differences between among all these contracts than from country to country. So it makes it quite difficult for any developing countries to manage uh, uh, their, their extractive sector. Um, and and it's, it's kind of a, a fact that uh, is sometimes overlooked that if you look at developed countries, most of their uh, extractive sector is managed through fixed terms, whether royalties, uh, income tax, or regulations. Well, we, when you go to developing countries, there's a tendency to negotiate about everything, which makes it very, very difficult for institution, for government, to actually manage the sector because of the complexity arising from these uh, variations. Um, so, so uh, framework, what's important is to have the whole set from mining policy, mining regulation, uh, fiscal regime, licensing system. Uh, and these needs to be clear, transparent, fair, and predictable. And I think the, the worst um, element that, that prevent uh, investment is really uh, the lack of predictability. So, so in our capacity building efforts with developing countries is really to make sure that they're developing predictable regime. Um, and, and at the end of the day, you know, it's, it's uh, and I think uh, Minister Parody raises the, um, the, the issue, it's, a, it's really a fine balance between uh, making sure to optimize benefits for countries, but at the same time keep a system that is attractive for investment. And, and, you know, I've seen countries that they had like very, very uh, good 
uh, mining or oil and gas regime for the government, but they had very little investment. So, so you really, and it, to a certain extent, it's, it's almost more than a, an art than a science to reach that fine balance. Um, uh, obviously, uh, governance, a good governance principle, uh, is really the corners, cornerstone of the whole system of the three uh, pillars. Uh, at the end of the day, if you have uh, you know, a proper frameworks, good institution, strong institution, but for instance, if the mining licenses are issued by the, uh, the president's office without taking to, into account these frameworks and the institution, uh, the whole system collapses. So, so really, governance is the, the framework of the whole, of the whole system. Um, and, and we believe that at the end of the day, I mean, our work is really to assist government. But um, from a Canadian perspective, I think Canadian companies, if we succeed to raise the level playing field for everyone, Canadian companies will actually do very well because they're used to work in a heavily regulated environment with probably more, one of the most uh, environmental regulation system, uh, most stringent regulation uh, uh, laws. Um, they, they used to deal with communities engagement to, uh, so uh, we believe that Canadian companies, that whether mining, oil and gas industry, if the level playing field is raised for everyone, they, they will actually do very well. Um, I don't want to take too much time to leave uh, time for question, but I, I think one of the challenges in, in trying to introduce these best practices is the fact that, um, and it's the same issue everywhere, is country needs to kind of balance their long-term vision with the short-term benefits, and, and it's, it's already difficult for developed countries to do that. So for developing countries with huge needs in you know, health, education, and all the other sector, there's, there's very often the short-term benefits tend to prevail over the long-term vision. So that's, that's a trend that we need to, to address very often. Um, I would say the second point is that one, and I think Minister Paradis mentioned it, one size doesn't fit all. I mean, people uh, discuss, for instance, Norway as an example for you know, petroleum wealth management, but Norway has probably the best governance on the planet, and their system is very, uh, I would say relax in terms of what you should do. To try to impose or implement this, the same system, the same framework in the developing countries, in many developing countries, it wouldn't work just because of the governance structure. Uh, and, and the last point I think that, uh, um, that it's, it's a mistake that many organizations have made throughout the years is, is to, to, come in, to come in with a, like a pre-imposed uh, structure or plan of assistance and I think you really have to start where the country is. Some countries are already quite advanced, so you have to start where they are. Some countries are further uh, back or further away, so you need to really start from where they are and then develop with them uh, the proper, um, as I said, framework, institution, and governance uh, uh, system. Thank you very much. I want to just put on notice, I'm going to put Michael Levitt and Peter Voigt on notice, I'm going to call on you at the end of this, so just you're, you can thank me for that later. But, um, but Marty, you're at the State Department, you're the uh, Deputy Director of Office of Energy Programs at, at the Bureau of Energy and Resources at the State Department. Uh, obviously the State Department um, thinks a lot about energy issues, so you might share, share your perspective with us. Sure. Thanks, Dan. Uh, and for those who are not familiar with the State Department and the Energy Resources Bureau. Um, we were formed three years ago this month um, in an effort to consolidate and elevate the department's engagement on energy issues um, and to make sure that we were approaching energy holistically um, through all the different lenses of our foreign policy interests. Um, and, and those include the entire range of our foreign policy interests from national security interests to our uh, economic and financial and trade interests, um, development objectives, and our human rights and anti-corruption agenda. And the Bureau really seeks to look at every angle of, uh, of energy through those lenses and what we do. Um, but very early on, we realized that uh, how other countries manage their natural resources impacts our foreign policy interests in addition to their own development agendas. Um, you heard statistics already from Dan and from Anita about uh, the, the percentage of, uh, of oil and gas coming out of the developing world and extraction and the reliance in the developing world on natural resources for their revenues and for their government budgets. Um, the scale of the extractive industries in, 
in the developing world uh, dwarfs many, many times over the scale of assistance that's going to those regions. And the, and the expectation about new investment in the energy and extractive sector over the next 15 years is such that if you want to have, as others have said, an impact in, in countries, um, you have to impact how they manage their extractive sector. Um, at the same time, we know that, uh, at least in Africa, for example, there's, there's uh, some who estimate that they're still losing more through mismanagement of the sector and corruption in that sector than they're receiving in investment and in foreign assistance combined. So there is still a need for, our, uh, for engagement to make sure that our, very practically speaking, that our aid dollars and our trade and investment dollars are having the impact we want them to have. Uh, and so we see both the, the philosophical and the practical reasons to engage in uh, and focus on good governance and transparency and accountability in the extractive industries. Um, in terms of how we do that, we look at it in, do we do it in three ways, really? Um, one is, uh, as you might expect, bilaterally. So working in our diplomatic engagement and our programmatic engagement with countries um, as they develop their resources to encourage them to do so responsibly and transparently. Um, we have foreign assistance programs that work with both governments as well as civil society groups to build capacity um, in the sector. We feel strongly that um, governments can't effectively develop their natural resources if they don't have the, a fundamental understanding of the resource, of how it's developed, how it's financed and marketed, um, and uh, at least enough knowledge to be able to regulate the companies that are operating there and, and to take advantage of the revenues uh, that they generate. Um, and that it's equally important to empower civil society to uh, serve as the check on government and hold the government accountable in this very complex and complicated uh, sector. It's very hold difficult to hold government accountable if you don't have a very well-informed and well-educated civil society to play that, uh, that role. Um, so we work, in addition to working bilaterally, though, with individual countries, and we can talk about some examples of that, um, it's equally important for us, and we've prioritized working multilaterally and looking at um, how we can raise global standards for expectations of transparency and good governance. Um, and, uh, and we do that through institutions like the G7 and the G20, which have been very active in the extractive space in the last few years, and through initiatives like the EITI, which others have mentioned and has now really emerged as a global standard for, for extractive industries transparency with now 46 member countries and perhaps a few more coming soon. Um, I think the other thing that we do, though, that is important to us is, um, is thinking about what we do here at home in the United States and how that impacts global energy governance and transparency, um, both because we are an example uh, to others and that's one reason why, one of the important reasons why we are implementing the Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative here in the United States. Um, but also because we recognize that we are the home government of multinational corporations and we play uh, a critical role in global financial, in, uh, the global financial economy. And so um, that's the reason why the United States has taken steps like putting in place many, many years ago very strong uh, Foreign Corrupt Practices Act and enforcing the FCPA uh, and really expecting compliance with that um, and why we were the first to put in place mandatory reporting requirements under Dodd-Frank 1504. Um, and we think it's important to, um, to, to model the kind of good behavior that we want to see in other countries here at home. Um, and I can go into greater detail in the Q&A about any of those topics. I just wanted to maybe give one example of a country that we've been doing a lot of work in that uh, I think represents kind of all of those action streams. Um, next week, the uh, government of Burma will host the EITI board in Naypyidaw for their quarterly meeting. Um, this is a country that has, as you all know, a very troubled history of extractive industries management. Uh, but one where the government has made commitments at the highest levels to really reform how they manage the sector. Um, and, and we have been working with them over the last couple of years, um, both bilaterally and multilaterally, in that effort. Um, we launched last year a, a country partnership under the auspices of the G8 to, uh, to focus on extractives transparency, and we have a uh, a foreign assistance program that targets their Ministry of Energy and National Oil and Gas Company um, to really professionalize and modernize how they, how they manage the sector um, so that they can meet their own reform goals in the country. Um, 
we also have worked with our companies here in the U.S. to make sure that they are um, modeling, when they invest in Burma, modeling the kind of good behavior and transparency that we want the government to adopt in that country. And so we've adopted um, in the U.S. a fairly novel set of reporting requirements for our companies when they invest in Burma across all sectors uh, that they have to report on their practices in some of the areas that we're most concerned about, whether that's um, labor practices or grievances or land acquisition or community engagement. Um, and I think that's been really helpful in, in demonstrating the kind of behavior and practices that we want the Burmese to uh, adopt themselves and we want other countries and companies to adopt as well. Um, and I think that those efforts, it's, it's early yet, of course, in Burma, but I think those efforts have started to pay off. We saw them uh, conclude a licensing round in April for offshore oil and gas that um, was significantly more transparent than we've seen previously. Uh, and you can see the success of that through the caliber of the companies that bid on the, on the blocks and that received blocks. And uh, of course, this past July, they were admitted to the EITI as a candidate country um, and have made steady progress since then in implementing. And, uh, and I think we'll get to showcase that to the world next week when the EITI board comes. So I think it's a good example of the United States as well as other donors and, and uh, multi multilateral organizations working together, focusing on, uh, on a particular country and a particular set of issues with a government that's interested in getting that help uh, and with the support of companies and the support of civil society groups on the ground to really start to make a difference. So let me stop there. Thank you, Marty. I was in uh, Oslo a couple weeks ago, and the EITI folks said that the fact, the fact that the United States had become a signatory of the EITI standards had opened the door to a number of developing countries wanting to join EITI because the United States had, had, had taken the plunge, if you will. So I think that was particularly interesting. Joanna, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. Hello, everybody. Um, it's really good to be here today and to have a chance to talk with you all. I think um, I would like to compliment the Canadian government because we have such a deep partnership between the U.S. and Canada on so many levels, and it almost never gets recognized. You know, your commitments, dear to my heart, on food security and other things have just been wonderful. And so I'm glad we have a chance today. It's been fascinating to have this conversation because I feel like there's a lot of joint learning going on. Um, Chevron actually operates in Canada and has for almost 80 years. One of our senior women leaders is Canadian, so we also have a close uh, connection to, to, the, um, to the country. Um, I think this is a really fascinating time in global development because there is enormous innovation underway. There's a lot of innovation in the U.S. and how we're thinking about things. I think the Canadian and Australian governments are taking on some really new approaches um, that are especially interesting to me because I think that while there are, there's money attached, there's funding attached, what's really innovative is that um, everyone's collectively saying, how do we actually really promote trade and development? How do we promote investment? How do we promote jobs? And how do we use our skills, our knowledge, our technology, our know-how? How do we use that to promote development? And I think the conversation today has reflected a lot of really good ideas. And I think in the next three, four, five years, we'll be able to look back at this as a really revolutionary time. So I, I'm here, I'm the only private sector person on this panel, so I, I don't, I'm not going to talk really broadly um, to some of the things that have been mentioned, but I just want to talk a little bit about some of the best practices in the extractive sector. Um, and I will say this is a massive, vast area of study and learning. You could spend your entire professional life just focusing on best practices about one particular piece. So I'm going to do a very high-level overview of what Chevron does in terms of best practices in the U.S. and, and internationally. Um, and these are generally industry standards. We spend a lot of time in industry working groups sort of trying to develop best practices and figure out what, what's going to work the best and how do we want to adhere to these processes. Um, so for Chevron, about 25% of our activities in the U.S., the rest is international. Um, Australia is a big footprint, but so is uh, Bangladesh and Myanmar. So we have a lot of activities in a lot of different places. And I think one of the most important starting points is, is just to say that everybody's treated the same, follow the same practices, the same standards. And that's, I think, just an initial starting point around best practices that I think you think of some sectors and that they may go offshore for cheap jobs, maybe they don't use the same labor standards. We have to be across the board safe and healthy. Um, and I think that that is a very important starting point. So I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about CSR and revenue transparency because you all want to know about that. But, but I want to highlight two other 
um, best practices that I think are actually even more important. So the first set of best practices, I think, is around just basic business operational principles. So um, one is workforce development. Um, Chevron has worked very hard to localize our workforces wherever we operate. In Angola, in Kazakhstan, we've got 85 percent local workforce. That is a serious commitment to growing people, teaching, training, and promoting people in the places where we operate. And I think those jobs and the impacts that they have on the broader community are, are very important. Um, a second area that no one really talks about because it's kind of boring, but I always like to mention is just basic business practices, management practices, operational practices, um, your finance and accounting and auditing processes, all those really boring technical business processes, I think have a really strong impact because the way American companies do business is very strong. And I think it, it, it is important in terms of a global best practice. Um, and then supply chain development is another part of our business and operations that can have a great impact. Um, just to give you some numbers, we talk a lot about CSR spending, of course, but um, in Angola, as one example, Chevron will spend about $19 million a year on sort of social responsibility and social investment. But our supply chain spend is over $2 billion in local goods and services. And, um, and Michael can talk about this when he makes a comment, but the efforts to train Angolan businesses to qualify and compete to a global standard to, to win business from Chevron and Exxon and other companies in the country, that has qualified companies in a really serious way to be competitive and grow their businesses, and that has real economic impact. Um, a second area that I can't overstate is uh, best practices around health, environment, and safety. These are just extremely important in the industry. We just cannot afford to have environmental challenges, to have safety problems. So everybody is trained on ways to operate, trained on safety. We focus a lot on safety. And safety for every single person and every single operation is treated as a major principle in how we do business. Um, it takes a lot of time to implement a safety culture. It's expensive. I sit in a Washington office where I don't feel in any great danger, but I still have to follow the same safety principles as everybody else. So it means that there's a commitment that every single person has to follow it. Um, one of the interesting examples of how this sort of fits in a development scheme is that in Bangladesh, when Chevron started operating, um, a lot of the local employees or a lot of the local folks who were employed um, they're smallholder farmers, and you can, I, we spend a lot of time on agriculture here. You can imagine protective clothing for smallholder farmers is maybe a pair of flip-flops and a hat to keep the sun off your head. Um, so there was a bit of shock to the system when the safety folks from Chevron showed up and said, here are your safety goggles, here are your hard hats, here are your protective steel-toed shoes, and you have to wear them at all times. It took a big shift. It was a cultural shift, but eventually everyone was very committed. Um, and I think the, the number of work hours without safety incident, this is a number that the company watches very closely. How many hours or how many days have you gone without a day off due to injury? In, that, um, in our activities in Bangladesh, it's been 60 million work hours since there was a day off due to injury, and that is no major incident since February of 2008. Um, we do an environmental impact, we do a safety impact, we do a social impact assessment for every major capital project. We look at all of the potential impacts. Um, Australia is not a developing country, but uh, in our investments there and our capital projects there, major, major, major investments in terms of envir environmental mitigation to ensure that we weren't damaging any of the sensitive areas where we operated. So I had to make a serious commitment to do this because if we don't, it's really a problem if there's an accident. You know, we just, um, financially it's problematic and just from a social perspective and impact perspective, it's so damaging that we have to be very careful. Um, social investment, which is what we call CSR, um, that is also, it's one of the pillars, as I said, environmental, social, and health impact assessments. So um, it is just integrated in every operation in every country where we operate. What are the social impacts? How do you do social investments that will promote the growth of jobs outside of the industry or in the communities where you operate? We do a lot of um, 
sort of joint design of programs where um, Chevron folks and community people will have a multi-stakeholder group sit down and say, okay, what, what's really needed in this community or in this country? Is it a vocational training process? Is it, we do actually a lot on agricultural development because a lot of the communities where we operate are, tend to be um, populated by smallholder farmers. So if we can't employ, we certainly can't employ everyone in the community in our operations, but how do we develop um, opportunities for people in the community to grow and to, um, to sort of create some economic development and growth around the operation. So agriculture ends up being an area where we actually spend quite a bit of time. Um, and I just, I, I'm racing through this. All of this is online on our websites. You can find what we do in every single country. So I'm sorry to give everything such short shrift. Um, I, I wanna end talking about EITI because everybody has touched on that. Um, did you say we've taken the plunge in the US? because I'm all wet from the plunge. <laughs> yeah. um, so EITI, the Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative is, I mean, it is, I think, the global standard for tr revenue transparency. Um, it's, it's a process that, that we have committed to very seriously at Chevron. We've had a member on the global board since the very beginning. We're involved in many of the, the local country uh, multi-stakeholder groups. Um, I'm the, the member of the U.S. board here for Chevron, and it is a, it's, it's a, it, there's a deep, deep, deep set of work and frameworks that have been developed for EITI, and I think it's, it's important to acknowledge that and to recognize how much work has gone into that because it, it, it is no joke. It is a very serious process. Um, and I think from my perspective, there are two, there are a number of good things about it, but one is that you do get the government, you get the um, companies, and you get civil society all together. And that, um, you know, just that level of engagement is important in terms of what comes out and the data that comes out in the final products, which is always a report with data and information. But I also think that the process in many places is as important as the product. Um, and Burma is a really good example because this is gonna be the first time that you're gonna have civil society and government um, leaders, and industry of course, but especially civil society and government, they're gonna to have to sit down, they're gonna to have to work together to come up with a product in a couple of years. And they're gonna to have to figure out how to make it work. And I think that that process of sort of building the muscles of cooperation is one of the, uh, the things we don't talk about quite as much, but is very, very important about EITI. So um, that's a real priority for us. And I'll, I wanna introduce, Veronica Kohler is here, who's one of the co-chairs of the US EITI process. Um, Dan, you may wanna put her on notice because she might wanna say something as well. Um, so she can talk a lot about, she's committed thousands of hours to this process. Um, one thing I will say, just to sort of with my development hat on, being a part of the US EITI process has been a little bit, I think, of a taste of our own medicine. Because I think about all of the processes that we ask developing countries to go through. I think about a country like Tanzania where you've got PEPFAR and MCC and Feed the Future, and I think Power Africa, and we're just, we're just pouring processes on countries. And as we try to implement EITI in the US, it is a very big time commitment. It is a very serious effort. And you know, I look around, I think, man, what if we had all of these other processes that we had to do? it would really be a strain. So I think it, it's kind of taught me a lesson about what we expect countries to do and report and how we expect them to, to operate um, and just sort of help me to kind of have a little bit more perspective on it that I think is something that I, I just wanted to raise with all of you in terms of considering your grant and aid packages. Um, so in, in closing, I'll just, again, I raced through all this, but I did wanna highlight some of the best practices. There is an enormous set. Um, I, you know, suggest you look at sort of, IPICA does a lot of best practices. Um, all of the companies and industry associations are looking at this. I think everyone's very committed to it and um, really enjoy the chance to have this conversation. And, and I'm looking forward to learning more about what the Canadian government is doing on this front as well. Uh, thank you, Dan. Um, first, you missed Alaska, which has a regime to recognize that the people of Alaska own the oil. They get a check every year. It changes the perception. Nobody views their oil like Alaskans view their oil. You may disagree with some of the decisions, but it's also an American model that no, no other state has replicated, by the way. Um, 
let me be difficult, <laughs> because everybody was so happy. Um, um, if extraction were so great, everyone in the world would be very rich today. And they aren't. I'm not saying there isn't a lot of change, because there is a lot of change, but the state of mind of people around the world is that these extraction companies, and I've worked for Canadian Mining Company and the American Oil Companies, is they all got along pretty well. We complain about lack of transparency and corruption. They all stayed. None of them left. And they all made a lot of money there. Now, everybody's finding God for good reasons, and I'm totally supportive, and I've made money helping them and hope to continue doing it. But it's silly to pretend that the base isn't pretty awful in a lot of places. There's another, for the stool, which is alternative economies. One of the big problems in the countries is if the only real income is oil and gas or mining, no matter how wonderful the company is, that industry is going to have too much power in decision making. It's just going to be. And uh, then the last point I would make is that, particularly with oil and gas, the name companies, and I've enjoyed working for Chevron, the name companies don't do very much. They contract for 95% of the work that's done in oil and gas. The other com companies do it, and in many companies, those companies are not held to the same standard that the big extraction companies hold themselves to. And uh, so I think that's a, that's a major thing that has to be recognized. And then the, I'm sorry, the, the last, I hope the last point, is that it's getting harder and harder because the technology uh, for hiring and training and the work is that it's harder and harder. So if it's off offshore oil and gas, you aren't going to have any local hiring. I mean, you've got to be a PhD to turn the boat on. So um, these, these things all make it more complicated, more difficult. I, I think the trend is all in the right direction, but I also think it's important to recognize the difficulties and the starting points in a, in a lot of this. And I'm sorry, let me just say one more thing. This, this, the, the combination of um, official de uh, development assistance is going way down and, and foreign direct investment is going way up in the same sentence would imply that foreign direct investment has the same kind of impact on people that ODA has. Now, that may not be the intention, but when you link those two thoughts, that's what happens. And if that were true, then we wouldn't have this great disparity in income. And obviously, you have to totally believe in trickle-down economics to think that that would be true. Tell us where you sit. Day job. Um, hello, I'm Veronica Kohler. I'm director of international policy for the U.S. National Mining Association. And right now, I suppose I'm being called on to talk about U.S. EITI. I'm the chair for the industry sector on the multi-stakeholder group. And as you heard from several of the panel members, the United States is um, trying to be a candidate. Well, we are a candidate country now. Um, our candidacy application was approved in December of last year, and we are working diligently uh, to get a report out and create something that is meaningful here in the United States. You know, I think, Daniel, something that you said resonated well with me. It's, it's looking at the short-term benefits versus the long-term goal. And in this age that everyone's focusing on transparency, it's important for countries to do what is going to be meaningful for that country and for the people in that country. country. Before National Mining Association, I worked with the World Bank. And so my heart has been in creating or working in extractive industries that have a positive impact on communities and for the country and long-term positive benefits for those countries. And we can do that in many ways. And we'll, we're seeing a trend now that countries are signing on to EITI or implementing their own mandatory reporting requirements. And I think we always have to think about the actual impact that's going to have on the ground and the realities <clears throat> of that can be sustained, both by the business and the information that communities will be receiving to make sure it moves forward in a fashion that actually will 
allow the communities to reap the benefits of living and working in resource-rich countries. Thank you. Peter Voike. You, you've had a couple lives. You've been at IFC. You used to you sit on the Saudi Aramco board, and you were on the Anglo-American board. So you've been involved with sustainability, but you've also been involved with the oil sector, and oil and gas sector, and you've been in the mining sector. Well, first of all, I, I think it's very interesting that the extractive industry is now accepted as a uh, industry which can benefit countries. I mean, 14 years ago, we were on the heavy attack at the IFC that we should not be in the extractive industries at all. Um, I think, um, and I don't want to criticize anybody on the, on the panel, I think we have to get away that the private sector is a do, are do-gooders. Uh, private sector is very fast adapting to new risks. And I found it fascinating that as soon as companies get away from CSR, spending money on local communities, on the environment, for social reasons, uh, to seeing that as real risks, uh, that they did a much better job. I think that uh, if companies recognize that social and environmental risks are as big or sometimes bigger than technical risks or financial risks or market risks, uh, I think we have something going for, 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 uh, for the extractive industries. Now the problem is that uh, these risks are only recognized in those countries where you have a strong civil society. I would argue today that the mining companies in Brazil, in Peru, are taking these risks very serious. Before they make an investment, they, t they calculate how much money do we have to spend, not only on f uh, to the banks, not only for marketing, et cetera, et cetera, but how much money do we have to spend that we don't run a social or a community risk. The problem is in those countries where civil society isn't strong, the companies don't, still don't pay much attention to that. And I, I think, think the only way to do this for the World Bank and for these institutions, increase capacity. We constantly talk about capacity increase, capacity increase. It was very good what I heard from the minister uh, of Canada. I think in Tanzania and Mozambique today, uh, it's great what, what is being done. They have huge gas reserves. But if you talk to the, to the government, they don't understand still what they have and what they're sitting on and how they should approach it. So where are these institutions to teach these companies, uh, these, these governments, uh, to, to do the right job? I think more emphasis has to be done there and finance civil society because they're very beneficial. Let's just get a reaction to these set of comments and then I'll open up for another round of, of, of hands. Why don't I start with you, Anita? So definitely, uh, we know that for the private sector, the bottom line matters. matters. However, I think, Peter, the point you just made of businesses starting to realize that this is a real risk for operations has been, in some sense, the motivating factor. And as I mentioned, I've seen just in the 10 years that I've been associated with this industry that the attitudes from companies have changed primarily because they know that it can have, it's a risk that can have an impact on the bottom line. Uh, the second point I'd like to make is on governments and capacity and also the point that Michael, you made on ODA and the benefit of uh, extractive industries. Um, yes, the conditions on the ground are terrible, but I also have to say, I mean, if you look at different countries, I've, I've just come from a meeting with the government of Mauritania. They are very, very clear what the natural resources mean for them. What they don't have is really the um, type of sophisticated uh, bureaucrats, technocrats, who can not just take decisions at the top level, uh, but actually filter it down to the implementation level. And that's where uh, a group like the World Bank uh, can really play. Uh, and we have been uh, working on, uh, with governments, on actually strengthening their ability to negotiate contracts. So uh, giving them the kind of support that they need 
to be an equal partner vis-a-vis -vis the private sector. But why I still think that this sector has a lot to offer to the developing countries is because ODA also depends on implementation capacity. And the difference here is that this is creating jobs. It can create, if managed well, small enterprises, local entrepreneurs. So the promise or, or the, the potential, potential that, that the extractive, extractive has, in my view, can, can far outweigh even ODA. ODA. So I, I would still say, if done right, this in the long term can be a better solution for countries. Uh, the, the third point is in terms of um, the um, subcontracting. And this is something that we have uh, addressed in our standards where we are pushing back on companies who we are financing who come back to us and say that this is not my problem. It's either the government who's responsible for this or that it is subcontractors. And we are making sure that we go the entire value chain and make sure that the uh, implementation goes beyond just the large companies. Um, I'll stop there. Thank you. Yes, a few points. I'm, I'm, I'm happy that someone, you know, raised that there's a lot of issues still. So because we would be out of work already if uh, there were not uh, a lot of things to uh, to sort out. Uh, I think still today, although there's, as I said before, there's there's been a lot of assistance provided to government. There's still an asymmetry of expertise and in, in information between the companies and government officials. And to go back to the point that was said uh, earlier, sometimes, and, and, and um, not to mention a country like Tanzania, for instance, you realize that the NGOs actually played a, a very strong role in terms of making sure companies were protecting the environment, dealing with local communities, and actually pay their royalties and taxes to the government. So the role that should have been played by the government in the first place was played by NGOs, um, which you know, uh, led to quite a bit of changes in the way Tanzania was dealing with the extractive sector. Uh, I also agree with the fact that uh, mining companies, or oil and gas companies, realize that part of their due diligence into, uh, before getting into a project is to make sure they will get the social license to operate. And, and when they go through all their permitting, uh, this has become one of the key matter because they realize that without this, although they have one of the best project um, in the world, if they don't get a social license to operate, they will run out in all sorts of difficulties. Um, so I think these are I had a few other points, but uh, um, no, I think that's it, Rona. Thanks. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, I would agree with what, what Daniel just said. I would, I would say um, it's absolutely true that, it, that it's not a very rosy picture everywhere in the world. And I think, you know, on the one hand, you have a group of countries, uh, particularly in Africa, that are sort of the next generation of big extractives producers that have looked around and seen uh, what's happened in other countries and seen it as a cautionary tale and sort of want to um, avoid some of those mistakes and want to do the right thing and are by and large sort of uh, democratic and accountable governments and there's a particular set of issues that you have to deal with in those countries and a big part of that is capacity building. Um, but I think it goes beyond that too. One of the big complaints we still get is uh, from, from those types of governments is that you know, no matter how much capacity building you do and how much training for us and knowledge transfer you do at the end of the day, uh, we're still sitting down across the table from a very large team of experts from an oil company or a mining company that have been doing this for 30 years, and there's 20 of them and there's still five of us. And there's still the perception of a disparity, even with all the technical assistance and capacity building you can do. Um, and that's something that in part's going to take time, but it's something, that particular issue is something actually the, the G7 agreed to take up this year to think about sort of creatively how we can help uh, level that perception of imbalance uh, even, at the, even at the early stages of contract negotiation. So there's a set of issues for those countries, but then of course there are uh, a set of countries where we, we haven't seen, frankly, a, the kind of political will that we need to see to change how they manage their extractive sector, and those uh, require different responses, and it's, and it's more difficult. And part of that is what we're able to do as 
uh, a US, the US government or as a Canadian government ourselves to bring more transparency. So things like Dodd-Frank 1504 that um, we have under our control to, to impact that sector. And, and part of it is uh, using that kind of information and other tools to empower civil society, as Paul said, to, um, to try and increase the accountability of those governments. And, and those same tools also increase the accountability of the companies. But those are certainly the, the harder cases, and we see a lot of those. Um, and I don't think there's one approach that you can take to the challenges in all of the, these developing countries. Um, the other thing I'll just say briefly on the subject of, of USEITI, I, you know, there are folks here that, that uh, can talk extensively about the domestic benefits of EITI and how fruitful that process has been, and both Johanna and Veronica have put in, as they said, thousands of hours into this process, and it's been fascinating to watch. But I, I will just echo Dan's comment earlier, the feedback that we've gotten internationally from that. Um, not even so much from the developing world, which has always sort of seen EITI as, or EITI has always sort of seen them as the target, but from the kind of middle income countries that um, are, don't look to the developing world. Crankier worlds, about this, right? That look to the United States or, the, or Europe or the OECD as a model, and they want to they follow that example, not um, a developing country in Africa as their example. So countries like Colombia or Mexico um, that are more likely to f join an organization or follow a standard that the U.S. or Canada is implementing versus uh, an African standard. And that's where we've really started to see the impact on EITI is in those kind of middle-income countries. And I think, for me, that's really exciting. Okay, Joanna. Yeah, I was, I was interested in meeting with some folks from an East Asian country who said, our leaders will just say, we're not corrupt, we don't need this. So if the U.S. and Australia and the U.K. are doing it, it makes it sound a lot different. Um, I mean, I, I don't even know where to begin. Michael, you alone laid about 35 questions on the table. Um, I think I, I will maybe start with capacity building because I, it is sort of the holy grail of development. I mean, in my view, all roads lead to capacity building, education, learning, and training. But the reality is this takes a really long time, especially around really technical fields. So I think to the, to the extent that we have learning exchanges, that people um, you know, do like TDA missions or things like that, to have exposure to different systems, I think that is very, very important. But it really will take a long time. This, is, this particular sector is very, very technical. But every sector has a, a large degree of technicality that just is going to take time. Um, I spent time looking at biotechnology regulation in a number of countries. And, and people said, yeah, capacity building's the answer, but there are only like six people in the whole country who are actually working on it. Like you can only, people can only learn so fast. So um, I do think it's important, but I also think it's gonna take time. Michael, I do wanna say one thing about your comment about declining, F, uh, declining ODA. Um, I, I always like to clear this up. Development assistance has just ramped up dramatically in the past 10 or 15 years. There's been a big increase in spending, and I know that there's fear that it's going to level off or it's going to start to decline. But the fact is that financial flows are just increasing overall, and so I think it's really important to, to balance that out. On, in terms of alternative economies, that is really at the heart of what, what Chevron is trying to do in a number of places. As I said, we can't employ everybody, so how do you use your social investment, your development spending, to try to help communities identify value chains or things that they want, they're good at or they want to invest time in so that people can have alternative livelihoods. That is a very important part of what we're doing. We're still, you know, we're in early stages in some places, but I think that that's um, a real priority. Um, and then I had one other comment, and then I can't remember what it was because there were so many qu questions on the table. But, um, you know, it's not a perfect picture. But there's a long way to go. But like everything, it's going to take time. And I think the more we stick it out and keep talking about it and thinking about it and um, doing training and discussions, the better. I'm cognizant of the time. Uh, we have an event at 3 o'clock. I want to thank our panelists for being here, and especially Anita George, who has, as I said, has a very busy week uh, with the World Bank annual meetings. And so please join me in thanking the panelists and 